All cells have the ability to regulate their gene expression. That is, to control which genes are active in functionally producing proteins and which genes aren't. This is an essential process in all cells. It contributes to a cell's identity. It dictates which signals they're going to respond to. It also dictates how they're going to behave in response to those signals. Now in prokaryotes, this process is fairly simple, with the majority of this being regulated by the transcriptional regulation of their operons. We've talked about this in a separate video specifically about operons. In eukaryotes, this process is much more complex, and there are lots of different levels and stages during the process that eukaryotes can regulate their gene expression, and that is what the focus of today's video is about. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about gene expression, or more specifically, how cells regulate the expression of genes. So all cells contain more genes than they need to have expressed at any given time. And it's very important that cells decide when and how certain genes are gonna be expressed while others remain silent. This is important for several reasons. First off, the process of transcribing genes and translating them into proteins is energetically costly. So it would waste a lot of a cell's energy to be producing proteins that aren't needed. Secondly, it's important for maintaining that cell's identity, particularly in multicellular organisms. So while it is important for prokaryotic organisms or single cell organisms to regulate their gene expression in order to make sure that they're responding appropriately to their environment, that they're growing only when they should, that they're dividing only when they should, in multicellular organisms, it's perhaps even more important because in multicellular organisms, cells are differentiated. In other words, each cell has its own job to do within the body. And in large part, that is maintained by which proteins a given cell produces. So when we talk about prokaryotic gene expression regulation, the majority of this is done through regulating the activity of operons. And we've spoken about this in a previous video specifically about operons. This is known as transcriptional regulation. You're regulating the expression of proteins by simply determining which genes are activated and which genes aren't. And eukaryotes are fully capable and in many ways do regulate their gene expression at the transcriptional level. However, they don't do so through the activity of operons, and they don't do it exclusively at the, tra at the transcriptional level like most prokaryotes do. So today, we're going to talk about the different ways in which eukaryotic cells are able to regulate their gene expression. And we'll find that while eukaryotic cells are more complex, it does give them an opportunity to regulate their gene expression in different ways that actually allows them to be somewhat more fine-tuned with how they regulate their gene expression. Whereas in prokaryotes, it's largely genes are either expressed or they're not. We'll find that that's not always the case in eukaryotes. So let's start with transcriptional regulation. Now, as I mentioned before, bacteria and other prokaryotes largely regulate their gene expression by controlling gene transcription. Genes are either expressed, transcribed, or they're repressed, not transcribed. In the case of eukaryotes, this isn't quite as simple because most eukaryotes do not regulate their gene expression through operons. Operons, in fact, are absent in the majority of eukaryotic species. Instead, unlike we see in prokaryotes, where the presence of RNA polymerase at the promoter region of a gene is sufficient to drive transcription, that is not the case in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes require the activity of a group of proteins collectively known as transcription factors. And transcription factors are broken down into two different types. There are general transcription factors, which typically bind at the promoter region of all genes and form something called the transcription initiation complex. And there are specific transcription factors. These can bind at the promoter region, but also bind at specific DNA sequences in the upstream enhancer region of genes. And for most eukaryotic genes, there is a requirement for both the general transcription factors that form the transcription initiation complex, as well as the specific transcription factors that will bind to the consensus sites at the enhancer as well as the promoter. Now, when we talk about general transcription factors in the transcription initiation complex, these will bind at the, uh, at the promoter region just upstream of genes, and their job is to actually bind to the promoter region and then help to recruit and load RNA polymerase onto the promoter and allow transcription to occur. The absence of these will prevent, prevent gene transcription from happening at all. If you want fully functional transcriptomes to actually occur, you're also going to need, in most cases, some of those specific transcription factors to bind at either the promoter 
and or the enhancer region to get full transcriptional output from a given gene. So you can see already there's a little bit more complexity when it comes to regulating gene transcription, even at the transcriptional level in eukaryotes. But if we back up a step further, there's actually a little bit more to this story in learning how transcription factors actually do their job. Because I want you to remember that eukaryotic chromosomes don't consist entirely of DNA as most prokaryotic chromosomes do. Instead, they consist of a combination of DNA wrapped around proteins that are called histones to form a structure called chromatin. Now, it turns out that the structure of that chromatin can take on two very different states in eukaryotic cells. The first one occurs when the DNA is very tightly wrapped around those histone proteins, and it forms a, a very tightly bound complex called heterochromatin. And when DNA is wrapped tightly around those histone proteins in forming heterochromatin, it turns out that the DNA is largely inaccessible. Now this is highly protective and it protects the DNA from other insults such as chemical insults or physical insults. On the other hand, it does also prevent access to most proteins. So for example, if, a pro if DNA is wrapped tightly into heterochromatin, it cannot be accessed by most transcription factors, nor can it be accessed by RNA polymerase to promote transcription, or nor can it be activated or reached by uh, D uh, DNA polymerase to do DNA replication. On the other hand, there is a loosely bound form of chromatin known as euchromatin. And this happens when the DNA is very loosely bound to those histone proteins. Now, while euchromatin is less protective with respect to encountering insults, it is accessible. So when it comes to euchromatin, this is genes that are located in regions of the, the genome where euchromatin exists are accessible. They can be transcribed and then lead to the formation of an mRNA product, which will eventually go on to be translated into a protein. They also can be replicated. Now, the thing to realize is this. The existence of heterochromatin and euchromatin is dynamic. That is, different regions of the genome are exist as heterochromatin or euchromatin depending on whether or not they are needed. It can change. To give you some dramatic examples, when we look at cells that are undergoing the mitotic stage of the cell cycle, where the chromosomes are physically being separated from each other into two daughter cells, the entirety of all chromosomes within that cell exist as heterochromatin. They are not accessible to proteins such as transcription factors, RNA polymerase, or DNA polymerase. The polar opposite occurs during S phase when DNA replication occurs. In that case, the DNA is going to be completely uh, in the loose form of euchromatin so that all of the proteins needed to do DNA replication have access to the genome. Now, what you have to realize is under normal circumstances, it's rarely all or nothing. Typically, some parts of the genome, some parts of various chromosomes are going to be in the the euchromatin state where they're accessible and other parts are going to be in the heterochromatin state where they are not accessible to proteins such as RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase and they are inaccessible. Now switching between those states is largely the activity of certain groups of enzymes that are able to modify chromatin in a way that either makes the binding between the DNA and the proteins tighter to form heterochromatin or looser to form euchromatin. So the enzymes that, are, that contribute to this typically respond to signal transduction pathways, and they're activated when certain genes either need to be transcribed or, once they're done being transcribed, need to be put uh, back into the repressive form in the form of heterochromatin. So how does this work? Well, we'll take, for example, a region of the genome that is wrapped up into heterochromatin, the inaccessible form, tightly bound DNA uh, wrapped around histone proteins. Well, it turns out that for the most part, when we look at heterochromatin, what we're looking at is DNA that has been modified by adding methyl groups to the cytosine nucleotides that, that are contained in that region of the chromosome. This results in a tight association between the DNA and the histone proteins. And if we need a certain area of the chromosome to loosen up to join euchromatin, that is going to be dictated for the most part by the activity of certain transcription factors. So one of the things those transcription factors can do when they land at certain regions in the genome, when they want to promote gene transcription, they're going to recruit a couple of different types of proteins to that heterochromatin complex because the first stage in this process is going to be to loosen up this heterochromatin to turn it into euchromatin. And they're going to recruit a couple different protein complexes. The first one that will come in is something called the SWI SNF complex. And the SWI SNF complex comes in and it removes those methyl functional groups from the cytosine nucleotides in the DNA. That's the first step in loosening up that association between the, between the DNA and the proteins. The next type of protein that's going to be recruited is something that's called a histone acetyltransferase, abbreviated as a HAT. 
Histone acetyltransferases add an acetyl group, which is another type of functional group, to the histones. The result of demethylation followed by acetylation in general is going to be to loosen up that DNA protein complex and yield euchromatin. Now that the DNA has loosened up its association with the proteins, now that the chromatin exists as euchromatin is now accessible to other transcription factors that can then go on to form the transcription initiation complex to recruit RNA polymerase and to do gene transcription. Now, the one thing I want to state is this. This is a necessary but not sufficient step. In other words, simply forming euchromatin does not mean that gene transcription is going to occur, but it's necessary if it is going to occur. It's the first step in the process. Now, let's say we are going to do gene transcription. We'll get RNA polymerase. We will synthesize a bunch of mRNA, and now the time has come to silence this region of the genome. In this case, other transcription factors will be involved and they will recruit an entirely different group of enzymes. The first one that's going to come in is something called an HDAC or a histone deacetylase. Histone deacetylases remove those acetyl functional groups from the amino acids in the histones. This is the first step in sort of tightening up that interaction between the DNA and the histone proteins. The next group of enzymes that are going to come are something called HMTs or histone methyltransferases. These are going to come in and they are going to re-add those methyl groups to the, DNA to the DNA molecules and firm up that association, yielding a tightly wound DNA protein complex known as heterochromatin. And again, that region of the genome will be silenced. This regulation of gene expression by modifying chromatin structure is what is known as epigenetics. And epigenetics is a fairly new field of genetic study that, we're be, that is, has grown magnitudes of what we understand about how gene expression is regulated over the past few decades. One of the things that's particularly interesting about epigenetics is it's a way that eukaryotic cells can dictate which genes are expressed without actually modifying genetic information. So to give you a few examples, when we look at certain regions of certain chromosomes, epigenetic regulation is actually permanent. It turns out that in some cells and in some parts of cells, regions of certain chromosomes are completely silenced throughout the lifetime of an individual. A great example of epigenetic regulation is what happens in genetic female humans. Genetic females have two X chromosomes. However, if all of the genes expressed on the X chromosomes were expressed fully, um, then female, genetic females would have an overdose effect of those genes since genetic males only have one copy of the X chromosome. What was evolution's solution to this problem? Well, it was to take at random one of the X chromosomes in each cell and simply silence it, wrap it entirely in heterochromatin and silence it so that no genes will ever be expressed from that chromosome. What's interesting is in, 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 in genetic females, about half of their cells, it's the paternal X chromosome that's silenced in the other half of their cells, it's the, the maternal X chromosome that is silenced. So it's about 50-50 in all genetic females. Another example of this is what's known as genomic imprinting. It turns out that in some cases, certain regions of certain chromosomes are, are, it, are silenced or expressed through the formation of, of permanent heterochromatin or permanent euchromatin structures. Which inter what is interesting about this is it means that you could inherit the same alleles um, from mom or dad or different alleles for a given gene from mom or dad, but you'll only ever express either the paternal or the maternal version of that particular gene simply because the opposite copy is permanently silenced in the form of heterochromatin. Now, under normal circumstances, this doesn't have many consequences, but what we do know is that it is actually important in certain diseases, such as Prader-Willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome, which do appear to largely have to do with which copy of a given gene is imprinted, which one is silenced terminally through the formation of heterochromatin. The final and perhaps most interesting thing about epigenetic gene regulation is that it does appear to actually be inheritable. There is significant evidence that certain imprinted characteristics are actually passed down from one generation to the next and may persist as long as two to three generations. So in other words, the epigenetic imprinting that occurs within an individual now may directly influence their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren depending on the nature of the epigenetic regulation. Like I said, this is a relatively new field of study and we're learning more about it each passing day. Another important factor in regulating eukaryotic gene expression comes in the post-transcriptional part of the process. 
So as you recall, when we looked at prokaryotic gene transcription, it's fairly straightforward and the mRNA that's produced through the transcriptional process is for the most part mature. It's ready for translation to occur. And in fact, in many cases, translation begins on an mRNA transcript that isn't even fully produced. In other words, transcription and translation occur at the same time. This, of course, can't happen in eukaryotes for several reasons. First and foremost is there is a membranous nucleus preventing the ribosomes from actually getting to the messenger RNA until it's exported. But another major consideration is the fact that the earliest mRNAs that are produced following transcription are just immature. They're called pre-mRNAs, and they need to undergo processing. The first step in the processing is known as uh, adding the 5' prime cap and the poly A tail. So uh, without adding the 5' prime methyl cap, without adding the poly A tail, this particular mRNA will never be exported from the nucleus. Another thing that needs to occur during mRNA processing is the removal of introns. If you recall, not every part of the eukaryotic gene is going to be expressed when we translate it into a protein. These regions of the mRNA that, will, that are not important for encoding proteinaceous information are called introns, and they need to be spliced out. Now, while gene splicing, uh, or mRNA splicing, I should say, is essential in almost every single eukaryotic gene, there is another way of doing this called alternative splicing. And in alternative splicing, not only are introns removed through the process of splicing, but some exons can be removed as well. This alternative splicing is actually able to produce different versions of a given protein. So for example, they can, remove, they can include all of the exons or they can remove some of the exons or they can remove exon, you know, the first exon, but not the third exon and so on and so forth. The end result is to produce different versions of a given protein. So for example, perhaps it will produce a version of a protein that could be secreted outside of the cell where another, uh, another transcript could produce a version of the protein that's embedded in the plasma membrane. And perhaps another, another version of that particular protein might be, might be sent to the mitochondria, whereas still another one might exist inside the cytoplasm. So in other words, you could have in eukaryotes uh, one gene that encodes multiple different versions of a protein with slightly different functionalities or expression patterns or, uh, or get released from the cell as opposed to being retained by the cell. This is a very important and powerful thing. And one thing to consider is that roughly 70% of all eukaryotic genes actually undergo some amount of alternative splicing at some point in a living organism. The final thing uh, with respect to post-transcriptional regulation actually goes back to the 5' prime methyl cap and the 3' prime poly A tail. Because once that messenger RNA is actually excreted from the, the nucleus, it's going to need to reach a ribosome in order to be able to be translated. And the longer that an mRNA persists in the cytoplasm, the more proteins that can be produced from a single transcript. So the thing to keep in mind is a single mRNA can be translated many, many times to yield many, many different copies of the protein that it encodes. This gets to something called mRNA decay. So it turns out that not mRNA, all mRNAs persist for the same length of time. And the rate at which an mRNA is degraded or decays dictates how much protein is actually produced by a given mRNA transcript. So you could imagine then an, or, that an mRNA with a shorter half-life or pers that persists for a shorter period of time will yield less protein than an mRNA with a longer half-life, an mRNA that will persist for a longer time once it's released into the cytoplasm. This is largely dictated by a group of proteins called RNA binding proteins. And certain RBPs or RNA binding proteins are able to bind to an RNA and extend its lifespan, whereas others seek to shorten its lifespan. Another thing that can influence how long an mRNA is stable uh, inside of the cytoplasm is uh, something known as uh, short interfering RNAs or microRNAs. And these, these RNAs are interesting. These RNAs are actually complementary to an mRNA. And when they bind to an mRNA, they do so through base pairing rules. The end result, however, is to turn that single-stranded messenger RNA actually into a double-stranded molecule. And if you recall, double-stranded RNA is not something that's really permissible in most living things. What ends up happening is that in the short term, a double-stranded messenger RNA molecule cannot be translated by a ribosome. So the initial effect is to functionally silence that particular messenger RNA so that it cannot actually produce a protein product. 
The next step is to have it removed. So what ends up happening is this double-stranded RNA molecule is recognized by something called the risk complex, RISC. It is then removed from the cell through degradation. Basically, the mRNA gets removed from the cell and no further protein is produced. This results in an effect called RNA interference or RNAi that turns out to be a very important way in which cells can fine tune their expression. Okay, I want some of this protein to be translated, but not too much. So eventually I'll produce a microRNA that will bind to and inactivate that messenger RNA and remove it from the cell. It shortens the lifespan of the messenger RNA, therefore shortening or therefore decreasing the amount of protein that will actually ever be produced from that messenger RNA. Now, of course, you could also hinder the ability of the ribosome to do its job. So ribosomes, remember, exist as both a small and a large ribosomal subunit. They need to uh, come together around a messenger RNA in order for it to be translated. So you can imagine if there was a way to affect or reduce the amount of ribosomes that are functional, uh, in that way you could actually greatly impact global translation efficiency, how much protein is being produced in the cell. And indeed, there actually is a protein that's known as EIF2, or eukaryotic initiation factor 2, that is essential for this assembly process. If you recall, the first amino acid that's going to need to be produced in any cell, or I should say the first codon that will need to be decoded, is that for methionine. And that requires a very special methionine tRNA to be present when that ribosome assembles so it knows exactly where to begin the translation process. EIF2 is essential for the loading of that, of that tRNA into the ribosome. And it turns out that simply by phosphorylating or adding a phosphate group to EIF2, can inhibit EIF2's activity, thereby preventing ribosomes from loading in that messenger, or loading in that tRNA for methionine, and then preventing the decoding of any messenger RNAs. Essentially, if you phosphorylate all the cells EIF2, you will have globally impaired the cell's ability to actually undergo translation. Now, this does seem to be a sort of blunt device. In other words, you're not being specific to which mRNA you're silencing. You're just silencing all translation. But this could be an important way of regulating gene expression. So, for example, if a cell finds itself in a period of stress, for example, if it's being attacked by a virus, or if it finds itself in a period of starvation where it doesn't have the energy to do any more transcription and translation, you could simply silence all of your ribosomes and your body in that cell will stop producing proteins. Of course, in the long term, this isn't a great solution and eventually the cell would end up dying, but uh, this could be an initial effort to prevent that cell from undergoing starvation. Proteins can also be modified after they're translated. This is done through the process of post-translational modifications. And post-translational -trans post modifications occur in several different ways. For example, there could be the addition of functional groups to the amino acids of a protein. We talked about, for example, histone acetylation is a way in which this occurs, uh, which a way that a histone can have its behavior modified by adding an acetyl group. We talked also about how kinases and phosphatases influence protein activity by modifying them through the addition or, in the case of phosphatases, the removal of a phosphate group from that protein. There can also be the addition of, of small molecules. So, for example, we could be adding groups such as a geranyl geranyl group or something known as sumoylation, where we add small molecules to uh, a protein that influences behavior. There's also enzymatic activities that can occur. So, for example, you could, uh, you could cause two different amino acids to form a disulfide linkage between the two of them. And finally, you can also undergo the process of cleavage. So some proteins are actually produced in a non-functional format. And in order to activate them, you actually have to cut a piece of them off. This is a process known as cleavage. Now, when we look at the different ways this can occur, um, this can occur through the activity of the ER or the Golgi apparatus. So if you recall, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus are largely responsible for modifying proteins that are going to be uh, that are going to need modification. These are ones that, for example, are going to be membrane bound or are going to end up finally in an organelle or to be secreted. This, of course, is going to largely be dictated by which functional groups or which post-translational modifications are going to be added to these proteins. It can also be done through the activity of enzymes, so kinases, phosphatases, histonacetyltransferases, uh, histomethyltransferases, and things such as that. And, of course, they could also be done by, by the activity of enzymes, for example, those that undergo cleavage. Some post-translational modifications are reversible. Phosphorylation is a great example. Acetylation is another great example. You can add or remove a phosphate group or an acetyl group. Other ones are permanent. If you cleave a protein, in general, this is going to be an irreversible uh, post-translational modification.
in general, post-translational modifications are going to affect the stability, the structure, the function, or the localization of the proteins that are modified. And the overwhelming majority of eukaryotic proteins are going to have some type of post-translational modification that impacts those particular aspects of its behavior. So in conclusion, let me remind you that all cells have the ability to regulate their gene expression and that regulating gene expression is essential. It helps cells conserve energy. It helps cells maintain their identity. It helps cells make sure that they have the right proteins in place, the right enzymes functioning in order to respond to extracellular cues, to ignore those cues that might not be important, and to respond metabolically to changes that need to be made. Of course, eukaryotic cells are much more complex than their prokaryotic cousins and therefore have many more levels of regulating their gene expression than eukaryotes do. And because the regulation of gene expression is so important to all cells, it should come as no surprise then that the dysregulation of gene expression has been implicated in numerous diseases, perhaps the most prominent of which is cancer. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot and I will talk to you very soon. Bye.